Ethan, it's 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 confession time. Go was, ahead, open I, up. What's up? I, <laughs> <laughs> you 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 almost sound like some one of my priest friends who's done with seminary and the in the Catholic tradition, and he's like he's ready. All he's right. like, okay, What'd go ahead. Um, all right, so I, I I told you all before Harvard that we weren't disclosing, and disclosure was terrible, and I hate it. Yeah, I was wrong about that. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I, I think I spent half of that trip realizing that I had drawn lines in the sand in the wrong places. And yeah, I remember I got out of my round and I was like, I just got destroyed by a progressive debater. But remember, I stuck to our ideals. He's like, do you want the case? Because I'm going to spread. I'm like, no, I want to practice my flowing skills. The dumbest thing I probably well, ever yeah, said. My bad. I'm and sorry. I texted you after the round. I just got destroyed. And then Crawford is like, did you take the case? And I was like. No, but since since that debate, we have revised our policies. We just have, a little bit. we have. I still think we've got to. We have to go all in on truth and communication, and in debate, that means we don't make up evidence. It means we don't clip evidence so that it changes the meaning of the the evidence that we read. But disclosure and spreading are not the lines when we're going when we're in an avenue where everyone else is disclosing and spreading. If we're going to compete at a national level tournament like Harvard University, then we can, we play the game slightly differently than we do at Dogwood or at Durham or at Coolidge tournaments. It's just a different kind of game, and we have to be able to play it and still do our kind of debate. We are, we are embarking on some moral development here for our debate <laughs> team. We are drawing up our own morals. That's right. Are we, uh, we're, well, you, no, we're not drawing up our own you morals. You sound so tragic. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you, Jen. That, that, yes. That, uh, Jen, do you want to come in and actually be on the episode? No. Are you sure? Uh, yes. All right. Bye now. Goodbye. I don't, why would I want to record myself? Never. Well, we just did. You're, you're, you're on the episode now. No. <laughs> we may or may not leave that in there. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I would not say we're making up our own morals, but I would say that uh, to maybe put it into a Kierkegaardian frame, uh, we are figuring out what actually is particular and what is universal and what is the what is part of the ethical and what is actually not part of the ethical, but maybe part of my own biases into what I like and don't like in debate. You you would never admit to drawing up your own morals, so I'm, no, I'm glad that you're sticking to. We your, don't. No, none of here. us draw up our own morals. That that that's that's the silly thing. That's a silly thing. So to we're say. just deciding which things we want to follow. We're deciding which things are actually aligned with the good, the true, and the beautiful. Right, I'm not going to push you any further. I know your brain is fried. We'll have that's this true. Another time. Well, ladies let's and gentlemen, Harvard. Uh, let's let's do. But first, uh, you do the intro. I did on the last episode. You 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 introduce the show today. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ethan Delves. And I am with Josh Herring, and we are the hosts of the uh, What's the Res podcast, where we talk about the current resolutions in the world of high school debate. And we just got back on Tuesday from the Harvard Invitational Tournament in Cambridge, and we will be discussing our thoughts on that tournament, some things that happened at that tournament, and where our, where our debate program is going to go and how it's going to change based on what we learned debating at Harvard. Very well said. So, uh, Ethan, just kind of narrate us through kind of your your six rounds. What? Just tell us the story of your your debate at at Harvard. How'd it go? Uh, what are some of the high points or low points? Take it away. Okay, I didn't do as well as I wanted. My goal was to win two rounds, and I went two four. But one of them was a forfeit because the guy didn't show up, and I had Ishan's coach as the judge for that round. So the feedback would have been so valuable if I could have um, had him as a judge, but. My first round, I hit a progressive debater, and Matthew Tweeden, the second I told him what school I was debating, 
called me, gave me exactly what they would say. He's like, I know this school. I know exactly what they'll run. I've debated them a hundred times. They're going to say this, 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 and there's going to be a plan at the end of their case. And it happened. Matthew Tweeden is like a crystal ball or something. Like he just knows everything. He's the <laughs> he's the overseer of debate. And he just called in. I feel like if you if any of our listeners have ever seen Criminal Minds, there's a character called Garcia that just does research on like who these criminals are, their entire past, where they are, and pings them and just knows everything. Matthew Tweeden is the Garcia of debate the debate world. So that was just amazing. Um they did run that against me, and I lost that round, even though he tried to tell me what to do to respond to it. I ran into a lot of progressive debaters, and I dropped to a lot of progressive debaters just because I'm not completely fit to argue against that style. Um, let's see. I did take one round that I was very proud of. Crawford was so gracious to just sit down with me and help me um, think through the different paradigms, think about what – and just teaching me the basics. I guess r- talking about the basics of LD and how argumentation needs to work uh, especially at a high level, like at Harvard. So I'm really grateful for him sitting down and talking with me for a little while. Um, there was, there, we had to wait three hours in between each round, three (laughs) hours. And I was eating a lot of, um, you know, Panera bagels at that time. There was burritos and Subway. It was all good, but it was a long wait. And that, that was just, it was, it was, it was a, not the best organized tournament, but I had some good rounds. I dropped more than I wanted to pretty much what I expected. The organizationally, I was not impressed at the at the tournament. I mean, they had a couple. Uh, they just they, they, we were ridiculously spread out over a weekend. There were there were no classes happening at Harvard over Saturday, Sunday, and President's Day. So it, it did not make sense to me that we had to be spread out at all these different locations. But I was at elementary school. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Like, where's Harvard? Oh, there was that uh, that great meme somebody put out on the group chat about like you, I thought. You're, you're it was like a picture of like a palace or something where you think you're going to go. And it's like, actually, I'm debating at the Harvard preschool as the second <laughs> panel. It was pretty yeah. great. Granted, that was the nicest elementary school I've ever seen. Man, had, when you like, pay $40,000 a year for beautiful. elementary school. I saw some of um, some really good friends, like just from the debate world in general. I recognized a lot of people at the tournament and got to spend good time with them. Yep. Um, I spent a lot of good time with a lot of my friends and learned a lot of stuff. There was some amazing people to sit down with, talked about different flowing drills and stuff like that. So there's some knowledgeable people at Harvard. I'm so glad I took that trip. That's great. Well, let's 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 hash out a couple terms then, because uh, you've been telling me for a couple days now that uh, progressive debater doesn't it, it means something different than just going fast. So yeah. I went into this tournament thinking that the primary markers of a progressive debate or a progressive debate approach are not being tied to the resolution. Uh, speaking really, really fast and bringing in kind of alternate issues to the resolution that are non-topical. Is that accurate or would you, would you adjust that definition at all? I would pretty much keep it the exact same. As far as speed goes, I would label that more if we're going to play with labels just as a progressive style of speaking, but it's completely associated with progressive debaters. Progressive debate is a way to win the topic without debating the topic. And the main distinction I was trying to make there is drawing away progressive debate from policy debate because we tended to talk about those oh, two that's things right. really similarly. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. The, the reason that, that I think we started to conflate those terms was because if our definition of progressive debate is, bringing th- is winning the topic with non-topical things, in LD, plans, counterplans, harms, disads, whatever, are non-topical things. But now that they seem to be part of the status quo in LD and people use them in LD, now the more philosophical debate is like big questions. We can worry about that over there. LD has a lot more to it than we originally thought. And we learned that by going to the Harvard tournament. So those, those things count, you know, plans, counterplans, like disads, harms, whatever you want to call them, are now a part of LD. But they're not necessarily progressive debate. I would say that things like K's are completely progressive debate because you're, you're necessarily right. trying to win this resolution um, on a non-topical issue. It's the same with policy debate. If someone brought a K into policy debate, it's not policy debate. That's a progressive approach to the resolution. Well, it is and it isn't because in policy debate, I mean, because that's where I would still – I think I'd still disagree with your distinction there because Lincoln-Douglas debate – and now this is the ongoing. This is a, yeah, this, this, this is never a whole, ends. Whole thing. Yeah. I mean, because policy debate is the oldest version. LD yep. gets its start, I think, in the seventies as a 
way to kind of get away from the Mm -hmm. fact that policy debate is no longer able to communicate with actual parents who come to judge. And that becomes a sticking point for running tournaments. If you can't actually rely on normal adults to judge, you need trained professionals. And there's all kinds of kind of cool arguments you could make, but no one else understands them except the ones who are in the link in the club. Um, so I would still argue on the grounds of kind of stylistic purity in a way that there are things that are unique to policy that should not come into LD. This is where the LARPer thing comes in. Oh man, yeah. Did you run into any of any of those? I, I've I never mean, actually if, seen if a round think, like that. If you just think of a LARPer as a policy debater being an LD, yes, my first round was like that. He was an amazing debater. He decided not to spread because I wouldn't be able to compete. Um, oh, that and was he, kind. he took the round, so he was he was willing to be nice about it, though. But yeah, I wouldn't label it like I think LARP is just kind of a meme term. I don't really think about it that hard. Yeah, it. it I still think. I mean, I walked out of there thinking we can do the same thing that we have always done. Mm-hmm. Um, with the addition of if we're going to go and compete at Harvard and at Yale, which is, I'm at least hoping we're able to do next year. That's that's the goal. If we're going to do that, then we got to get – I mean, so you and Megan and Grace all need to be up above 300 words per minute. Uh, maybe uh, maybe more. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> we need to be ready to give cases and we need to take cases – and if they're going to put their case up on the wiki, we need to download it and we need to run through it and we need to pre- prepare blocks to it as much as possible. And we just have to go into the round knowing that that's, that's a piece of the game that happens. And that at this level, the framework debate changes. Mm-hmm. There's still a weighing mechanism. There's still a way to compare which of these versions of the uh, – uh, whether Af or Neg has the best – preferable world or the strongest representation of ideas or the greatest amount of evidence. It's just cloaked in a whole bunch of uh, what Dr. Begley would call uh, ergot, er, uh, argot, random jargon that is meaningless to those outside of the jargon circle. Okay. I think, and this reminds me of our conversation with Crawford too, because you were sitting there and you had this whole epiphany and yep. it was a really, it was a really funny moment to watch too. I was, I was enjoying that where you, we realized that, All of these labeled terms that we don't necessarily know how to deal with are just formalized ways of doing what we already do. Mm -hmm. Talking about a disadvantage for a resolution at its most – I think um, I could completely butcher this just because I don't know the correct – or maybe we'll go with like harm. It's like the affirmative can list a harm. Like what does that even mean? But what we've been doing forever is talking about what's what's a bad – or what's a reason to not accept the negative side? Yeah. That's what that's all a harm is. All LD is doing or all of all of what we labeled as progressive things are doing are formalizing and putting a structure to the things that we've already done. And granted, I don't completely agree that things like plans and counter plans should be in Lincoln Douglas debate because they're, they're, those are the things that you vote on in policy debate. And we intend to vote on different things in LD debate. But I think that there are certain things, again, trying to draw lines in the sand wherever they need to be drawn kind of a complicated process. There are certain things in LD that I saw at Harvard that I think I'm okay with staying. Such as? I mean, like uh, all of those pieces you just mentioned or anything anything else in particular? So I, I've actually enjoyed the disads and the harms. And I think it's, it's just not good for me to just list the things off because this list is going to change as it goes. Yeah. I wasn't completely opposed to the idea of a plan and running T. Maybe that means I should go debate policy and I'll just have, or that it means I could stay in LD and just have policy without stock issues. But it, it's the question of what is LD intended to be and is it okay for it to change over time? Because new new people can still break into LD. And like in North Carolina, we have new people or novices, novices do great in LD all the time simply because LD tends to be a more traditional form of debate. It's harder for progressive debaters to break in, especially in North Carolina in the Dogwood Debate League. Um, only when you get to those higher out rounds where the judges are becoming more and more trained do we see progressive debaters actually picking up. Uh, and But at the same time, I think a couple of those things make Lincoln Douglas a little bit more interesting and a little bit more tactical. And after having been in Lincoln Douglas for about four years now, I'm ready to up my game and to to learn the nitty gritty tactics of how to just be a better debater and what I need to do. Like if someone runs a plan, 
what's my first step? Someone runs a counter plan. What's my next step? When can I pull out this topicality or this T shell against them? That kind of thing. Yeah, that's and that that that's so you're right about thinking of it as a higher level. I mean, it's it's as if suddenly the debate goes from a boxing match to a game of chess. And yeah, which is which is fun. That makes it. Yeah. I think that would make it more fun. And it, it can. You know, but I think we need to find a way to not lose the truth in playing because the chess still has rules. We don't and those and I guess you could put that analogy towards debate. We still are within the confines of truth. I'm not one. I don't think I would be one to run a K. Like if I ever, ever chose to run a critique against something, it would be because I believed in the social issue and I believe that somehow someone is bringing harms to that social issue with the critique. I'm not one to run the TikTok critique that someone ran at Harvard. What? The, I don't know. Some like SpongeBob thing. <laughs> I don't even know. You, you hear about crazy stuff. Someone literally said at Harvard, this guy was telling me about his round. Whoever can perform the TikTok renegades dance better should win the round. And that kid lost the round because what the heck? I mean, um, yeah, so I'm not one to like win a K or trying to win on something not no. topical. Do I see room for things like plans and counterplans to sort of bolster the topicality of the debate? Like, hey, how would we actually do this? No. Like with a, within the philosophical frame, can we see this actually happening? Does it matter if it happens? I think that that has some room in Lincoln Douglas, at least. I, I think it does. We can definitely. Oh, man. T is fun. That I mean, that was that was the strategy yeah, I loved. Yeah, I lost and, trying and to argue too. You you got to set it up right, and I I don't think I've taught you how to run T, but we can we can certainly work that in in future months. But it's a if you can prove that the other person is off topic, it's it it works. It's a beautiful beautiful strategy. Uh, theory debates can also be very fun. It's also something we've not done anything of, but it can be. They can be very fun. But you have to persuade the judge to accept your understanding of debate and how the yep. other person has violated it. And then the other person comes back, and it really becomes. I mean, it's another shift from the resolution to something. Before we can debate the resolution, we need to have agreement on what debate is and what it's trying to do. Um, no, be I lost a round on theory and the judge, like he was an experienced judge and I went in knowing, and the kid said, I'm going to run progressive arguments. Do you want the case? And I said, yes, didn't get it because Wi-Fi." And, but he didn't spread, which was great. And the judge, the, the kid ran so much stuff. He ran like theory and all these other complicated things. I yeah. saw like one argument that I tried to refute because that's what traditional debaters do. Cause they don't know what to do with the other stuff. And the judge at the end was like, the kid was neg. He was like, I'll vote theory on neg. But like, gosh, why would you do him like that? Like, you, obviously he has no, like, not like he has no idea what he's doing, but in order to make the debate space more accessible, you should have debated more traditionally. Like you just yeah. picked up that round on an underhanded move. Um, I'm going to give, so I got higher speaks for that round as like a rest easy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we just called it a day because I didn't know what to do with the theory, but take that for what you will. That's just how the game goes. Yep. It, it was, it was a fun game. Uh, so Oh yeah, we mentioned this on a previous episode. We should probably get into it now. There's um, then wrap this up. Um, so I came away from this tournament thinking that next year I want to present this to people as this tournament's worth going to, but don't expect it to be terribly well organized. Also, don't expect your opponents to fight fairly, and basically we should expect to be screwed over by tab. Um. And I have uh, three quick stories to support that. I was about to say, I knew there was some examples there. Yep. Uh, we had two of our PF teams ran against uh, on the universal basic income versus means tested welfare. They ran against communist cases that had and had a judge who was a full both both of their round. Both of these rounds had a Marxist judge. Uh, the worst round I heard them tell me about was, uh, the other team was arguing that we should spend $67 trillion on a UBI so that we collapse the United States economy. Did you know what? that we're, we're all unhappy, Ethan, because we have material prosperity and stuff. So when we collapse the economy, <laughs> we won't have any of that anymore. We'll be back in like caveman happiness. I'll just sit here quietly while you go on. Yeah, that, 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 it's, it's insane. Uh, so we should expect to run into that in Congress. I, I, this is the most, this is the most egregious thing. The presiding officer told the room that they, the finals round was going to be three hours and 45 minutes. And I was on the judging panel with eight other, eight other coaches. And we all kind of braced ourselves for a three hour and 45 minute round. The, 
other team or the and the 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 parley the parliamentarian didn't say anything about it. And three hours and five minutes into that round, uh, a uh, there was a, a tab official came into the room and said, "That's it. That was the last round, or the last speech. This round is over." And there was the last forty minutes. Uh, the, everybody who would have spoken in that round did not get to speak. Uh, and it, it definitely skewed the ballot. I. Yeah. I didn't really realize how what exactly had happened until it was all over, but it, I didn't feel great about that ballot. Um, the last one was something I saw on the uh, National Debate Coach Association page and has since been confirmed. I don't know who this coach was, but there was a coach who went to the uh, PF Judges Lounge, gave special instructions from TAB about how to score, how to do speaker points during round six. He was not from TAB. <laughs> And okay. his special instruction skewed who broke after round six because so he it, just changed how people scored the debaters. Uh, something like that. Yeah. Does, does the does Tab have a specific way that you're supposed to do it? Well, he he came. I don't know what exactly he said. He came in, but he said like, okay, you should handle speaker points this way, and it somehow adva- probably advantaged his team. And anyway, that coach has now been. Uh, has has been banned from the tournament, so which means wow. it probably did actually happen. Uh, yeah, so it just crazy stuff. Um, huge tournament, fun tournament, worth going back to. But in terms of competition and organization, I like our local tournaments better than than Harvard. But oh, I, I'm a huge fan. Durham Academy, all of the uh, Duke tournaments. at the beginning of the year was so good. I wish I would have gone to Duke. Yeah, um, I don't regret not going, but I think it would have been cool. Yep. Uh, just to see Maya win another tournament. <laughs> Maya, if you're listening to this, we're honored. You crushed me in that round. Good job. Um, <laughs> yeah, our local tournaments, and shout out to Crawford too, because he's he's just been so good with organizing these things so and keeping true. things moving quickly and moving fairly. So oh he he's great at what he does. We're appreciative for that. Yep. Uh, I should have him. I think I've, I've got to email him for a day, but I think he's coming on an episode later in, in March. So we'll get to nice. interview him at some point. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, you mentioned we were also going to talk about like plans for next year. So I'll show those out real quick and then we should yep. wrap this thing up. Uh, I just put our competition calendar together for next year. Uh, so far, we're looking at four Coolidge tournaments next year. Uh, probably four dogwood tournaments and then plus two big local ones, uh, Durham Academy and Duke university. Uh, I'm hoping that we can make it to Yale in the fall and Harvard again in the spring. And then we are geared towards three different national tournaments because we'll have, uh, uh, depending on how Dogwood goes with various events, you've got the NCFL, the National Catholic Forensics League. We might have some people at their Grand Nationals next year. And then we've also got the NSDA Nats. That would be kind of cool. And then also there's the um, – and then, of course, there's the Coolidge Cup. Oh, and I did find today there is a five-day uh, tournament in May down in Houston, Texas called the Blue Bonnet International World School Debate Tournament. It's three days. I guess six days total. It's three days oh, of yes. an academy of like how to do world school, and they teach you everything about world school format. And then it's th- a three day tournament. Let's do it. So maybe that that that's got to get. It's it's during the month of May, so it's during the track, which means it needs admin approval. So, but we'll we'll see. I'm working on that. Awesome. So it's yeah, it's so I, yeah. Overall, I mean, that sounds like an amazing schedule for next year. I think we've had a great year so far um, for for my junior year, for just how we've been doing. We all did really well at Harvard, better than expected. And I'm like, just quick shout out to our chaperones, too, um, for coming on the trip and just doing such a great job and keeping everyone together. Uh, We we appreciate everyone that came on to that trip and everyone that helped make it work. Um, Josh, I know you did a great job with everything. Everyone had a great time. So it was just a great trip overall. I can't wait for next year. Hopefully we'll get to the budget for that to go again. I hope so. That'd be so great. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to us chat about our uh, experiences at Harvard University. If you want to share your tournament stories with us or, or ask us any questions or let us know what you thought about this, there's a bunch of ways you can get in touch with us. You can email us at whatstheres at gmail.com. You can find us on our various social media platforms. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Reddit with the handle at whatstheres underscore. Uh, we have the, you can search at what you can search for what's the res on YouTube. You'll find us there. You can also go to facebook.com com slash what's the res to like our page uh and of course you could also go to uh, uh go to apple podcast leave us a positive review that would be great uh that would that's the best way to help other people find our show and if you're like us and you always need more debate in your life you can also go to our website www.whatstherez.com click the banner it'll take you to our premium debate page where you can check out the uh the debates that we've recorded and posted there so until next time Work hard, speak well, and seek the truth.